Ladies and gentlemen, I am Paul, U.S. Army Combat Veteran. It is August 25th, 2022. This is your daily Ukraine update, and we are going to be asking, one, are the sanctions even working? And two, have we finally figured out, or rather, has Russia finally figured out its operational objectives? Let's get into it. So, as always, we are checking out the map, and there is only two zones where there's been any changes at all. The first is in Bakhmut. I think this is actually just the the map makers cleaning up their lines a little bit also maybe reality cleaning up the lines usually what happens when you have an advance right you see some territory but then you have to hold it and what's very common is commanders look around and they say hey even though we've advanced let's say all the way to this open field they say you know we really can't defend an open field so let's pull back a few hundred meters to say a tree line or uh you know, behind a hill or something that's more defensible. So this is sort of, I think what we're seeing here is maybe the upper limit of advance is right here, but why would you want troops, right, sort of pinned uh, between these two major highways? So instead they sort of said, hey, let's try to withdraw from here, reposition, and put ourselves in a position where we can kind of like provide some mutual support. So I think that's what we're seeing. I don't think we're seeing necessarily big advances i think you're just seeing the sides kind of sorting themselves out now that said i think it's become eminently clear that this the city town of bakhmut is in fact russia's number one operational objective right now it, it seizing bakhmut might allow them to create a salient here around Sevirsk, and they may believe that by seizing bakhmut they can begin to swallow up this Sevirsk uh, area so that's why they may be focused primarily on this city here and as you guys can see if they can seize uh Bakma, they may be able to exploit this MO3 highway to move forces, right? If they can seize it, they can use that highway to push more forces up this northwest corridor. And then at some point, Sevirsk may become risk being too cut off because as you guys can see, there's not a ton of easily accessible roadways out of Sevirsk. Basically, it looks like you're going to be dependent if your goal was to get to, say, a major city like Krematorsk or Slovyansk, your options basically are this roadway right here. So that means that if the Russians, Russians can put this road intersection in danger, then you'll have to see a Lusachansk style withdrawal. So I actually think that's what we may see here. Seizure of Bakhmut pushing along this line and creating another cauldron that will force uh, Ukrainian forces to withdraw and yield a lot of territory. As we've discussed though, this has been slow going uh, just to reach Bakhmut and almost undoubtedly the Ukrainian forces stationed in Bakhmut are probably digging in. Uh, let's see if we can actually find the map here. Uh, there we go. Ba -ba -ba. Let's see if we can find the deployment map here and see what Ukrainian forces they have in the Bakhmut area. So you can see it's actually just the 58th motorized rifle brigade that is holding on to this salient. You can see here to the south, the 72nd motorized, uh, mechanized, excuse me, mechanized brigade. Um, but these are, th this primary objective for the Russians, as far as we know, are being held in place basically by two brigades, while the majority of the fighting that we know of is it, within this salient in Sevirsk. So that in and of itself is telling that even though this is Russia's primary effort, it doesn't appear to be Ukraine's primary effort, where a lot of their forces remain allocated right here. Of course, this could very well be out of date. The other area where you're seeing actually several times more Ukrainian forces is near Donetsk, right? And that is the other objective of the Russian forces that it appears is, of course, to secure the DNR's capital city of Donetsk. And you can see here they've they've attempted to flank around this small village of Pitsky uh, by seizing some empty fields here. Will this work? Again, at least we're seeing something that looks like fire and maneuver. It looks like actual tactical commands. And this sort of makes sense. I think that maybe the pressure may be off of Russian commanders to make big sweeping gains. Uh, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu uh, has said that, in fact, 
uh, Russian troops will be slowing the pace of offensive operations, and he's framing it as a conscious effort to minimize civilian casualties. But in reality, I think it's a way of saying, hey, listen, we understand, commanders, that we're not giving you enough to work with. We don't need to see big sweeping breakthroughs. We don't need to see major victories. We're okay with you guys taking very bite-sized pieces of the battlefield. And so I think that's why you're seeing things like this little flank around Pisky. You seize Pisky, right? Then you can begin to attempt to recontrol the Donetsk airport. Uh, same in Bakhmut, right, where they say, hey, listen, we don't expect a big sweeping flank into Bakhmut. It's okay if you guys just seize some key roadway intersections, frame around the city, seize it at your own pace. So I think that's what we're seeing here. But let's talk about kind of the big picture news, right? And one of the, th the stories that's going around, been reported by ABC News, is that six months into the war, Russian goods are still flowing into the U.S. Now, Major Russian corporations are continuing to sell everything from birchwood flooring to weapons grade titanium. Uh, and what is this situation talking about? Well, here's the thing that yes, in 2021, there was about 6,000 shipments of Russian goods arriving in the US. Now that number has dropped by nearly half, uh, right? A lot of raw materials, wood, metal, rubber, other goods. But here's the thing. Sanctions are hard for a bunch of reasons. First, the longer sanctions go on, go on, the easier it is to circumvent, right? Because it's just like any other problem, right? If if a road near your house was to get closed off for construction in the first hour, you would be confused. You'd say, "Oh, what the hell?" It, you might not even be sure how to get around. But if it was closed for a month, you would wouldn't even think about it you would find the detours and you would just take them and sanctions are the same way right sanctions regime regimes are complicated and sometimes they need time uh to be understood so initially you might say for example hey russian companies no way you're not allowed to sell in the u.s well over time the companies that are banned may do things like take ownership stakes in those smaller companies. They may create new companies. They may use uh, shell companies in other countries like Belarus uh, or Moldova. And so suddenly you're not buying Russian, uh, you know, widgets. You're buying Moldovan widgets, not realizing that it's a Russian company that just ships its goods across the border in a train. So the longer this goes on, the more likely you are to see Russia uh, actually be able to export more goods you know i would be curious to know and though it, we really probably can't because they're pretty good at concealing true ownership if some of the remaining shipments of goods are actually coming through flat other flagged countries if they're coming through as again moldova belarus etc so and you can't when you impose sanctions right there's always a trade-off uh, U.S. companies do depend on Russian raw materials, so you cannot simply drop that number to zero. And as we've seen recently, even small disruptions to the general flow of economic activity, right, even ones that last a few weeks or months, uh, can have tremendous ripple effects through the economy. So even though this seems like not that big a decline, uh, over time, it represents a lot of potential Russian economic potential that could be cut off. Once again, we'll see how much is actually cut off. Anyway, guys, that is all I had. Of course, if you want to see some combat video breakdowns that are too spicy for YouTube, right? The ones that uh, I, you know, I used to used to do early in the war before YouTube cracked down. You want to become a member of the Patreon. Link is in the description. Thanks to my lieutenant tier patrons. I'll catch you guys in the next one.